But without further ado, I'm going to have my uh, cohort here, Wes Clark, uh, go ahead and turn his video and audio on. And hi, Wes, how are you? And we are going to, Wes is going to introduce Sarah to begin uh, Sarah's presentation. Whenever you're ready, Wes. Oh, okay, thanks. Yes, uh, I'm Wes Clark. I'm the archaeologist on staff here at the castle. And uh, thanks very much for tuning in tonight. Um, we've been talking to Sarah for about a year uh, uh, about doing this. And of course, we had originally hoped that she would be doing this in person uh, here at the castle during one of her rare visits to Marietta. Uh, but of course, uh, we're forced to uh, shift to, uh, to this format because of the COVID situation. Um, before I tell you some specifics about Dr. Murray, I wanted to briefly note an unusual archaeological circumstance that developed out of Marietta, which is that Marietta and its public school system has produced uh, three archaeologists specializing in classical civilizations of the Mediterranean region. Uh, this includes Dr. Brian Rose, a world-renowned excavator of the city of Troy in Greece. Dr. Allison Cartmel Emerson, who was in the same uh, Marietta High graduation class with our speaker. That's the class of 2000 and has been working in Pompeii for the past 15 years. And then tonight's speaker, Dr. Sarah Murray, whose research focuses on the region of Greece. Now, I understand that in the world of classical archeology, span uh, this circumstance has come to be known as, quote, the Marietta thing, unquote, and leaves me at least to wonder if maybe it's something in the city water that's produced all these uh, classical archaeologists, it is a rather unusual uh, number of folks like that coming from a small town like this. Anyway, let me tell you now something about Dr. Murray's background. Sarah C. Murray is currently Assistant Professor of Classics at the University of Toronto. She received a BA in classical archaeology from Dartmouth College in 2004 and a PhD in classics from Stanford University in 2013. She is a professional field archaeologist and has worked at many sites throughout Greece, including a Bronze Age harbor site, a Mycenaean chamber tomb cemetery, traditional bronze, transitional bronze to Iron Age site, on the Greek islet of Mitro and a cave art site in southwestern Crete. Those are just some examples among uh, many places she's worked. She is currently the co-director of the Bays of East Attica Regional Survey Project, which is situated around the Bay of Porto Rafti in southeastern Greece. Her scholarly research interests include the development of Greek economic and ritual institutions between the end of the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age, that would be circa 1300 to 700 BC. She's also interested in archeological survey methods and the use of quantitative evidence in archeological research. Dr. Murray's recent publications include a variety of articles on her research and a book titled, The Collapse of the Mycenaean Economy trade, imports, and institutions published by the Cambridge University Press in 2017. A second book forthcoming in 2021 with the same press has the provocative title, Male Nudity in the Greek Early Iron Age, Production, Representation, and Ritual Context in Aegean, in Aegean Societies. Finally, Sarah was born and raised in Marietta and was inducted into the Marietta High School Athletic Hall of Fame in 2018. And now, Dr. Murray.
Uh, okay, um, I, I guess everybody can hear and see me now. Uh, and I'm just um, loading up the slides for my, for my presentation. Uh, so well, that's, there we go. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks Wes and uh, thanks Kyle um, for inviting me and introducing me. Um, uh, I grew up, I lived most of my life very close to the castle, uh, probably, you know, less than a block. <laughs> so this is a very, um, I guess it's a very local talent talk. Uh, not that it really makes a difference anymore since we only all exist in our uh, small uh, Zoom universes now. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's, it's a fun opportunity for me to get to share uh, what I've been up to since I left Marietta back um, many years ago now uh, in terms of my, my research uh, in archaeology. And it really is, as uh, Wes was saying, a, a long running joke uh, in classical archaeology that this little town in the middle of nowhere <laughs> somehow has produced a very high um, per capita rate um, of classical archaeologists. So if anyone has any theories on why that might be, then maybe we can discuss them in the Q&A. So for this evening's talk, um, I'm going to be uh, talking, uh, telling you about um, some of my, uh, my research and in particular uh, the field work that I've been doing um, most recently. Uh, so, uh, um, as was noted in the introduction, I'm now running a field project uh, in southeastern Greece um, in Attica. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the topic of my talk today is kind of what, what, what I'm doing there, why am I working in this region uh, in the first place, um, what's interesting about it from a research perspective, and then um, also kind of what we've, what we've been finding so far. So, uh, the, I'll split the talk into into three parts, uh, more or less. Um, so first, just you know, since um, many of you probably don't know what a a late Bronze Age collapse is or what a Mycenaean is, um, I'm, I'll just provide some general, very general context um, of the kind of thing I'm working on and the general problem that we're trying to address. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that has led me to uh, this area that I'm working in the field now. Um, and then I'll talk about, you know, what we've been finding in this region. In particular, there is a really interesting site. Um, we've been investigating on a, a very small, um, yet uh, very archaeologically rich um, uh, uh, site uh, in, in the region. So without further ado, we'll begin with, um, with the general context. Um, so the late Bronze Age collapse. Um, is a, a, a research area that is kind of what I work on generally. Um, and it's hard to understand why what we're doing in Puerto Rafti is interesting or important uh, without having some understanding of what's going on with the late Bronze Age collapse. So I'll start with that. So in the, in the Mediterranean, um, the, late, the late Bronze Age uh, is a period that um, uh, lasts for about 400 or 500 years um, in the second half of the second millennium BC. Uh, when we talk about the Mediterranean in the late Bronze Age, uh, we're dealing with a period in which there were a number of uh, re relatively large and relatively complex states uh, kind of scattered around the Eastern Mediterranean basin. You've probably heard of some of these, so the so New Kingdom Egypt, um, the Hittites are this very powerful empire um, that is in control of much of Anatolia in this period. Um, and there are other big complicated or complex states um, kind of throughout the, um, the Near and Middle East, so the Hittites, uh, I said the, the Assyrians, um, the Babylonians, these kinds of um, big and complex states are a, a major feature uh, of life in the late Bronze Age. Now kind of on the, on the margins of that world uh, is, uh, is Greece. Um, and during the late Bronze Age, um, Greece uh, was also the a seat of a large, relatively complex state. Uh, we call that state the Mycenaean state. Um, and that name comes from a type site uh, called Mycenae, uh, which was, uh, it, it's an important site for the period. Um, it also just happens um, to have been excavated relatively early. So we call right, these states, the state that exists in Greece in this period, um, the Mycenaean state. Uh, the Mycenaean state in terms of its uh, material culture, right, so the kind of archaeological traces it's left behind, um, 
is characterized by a number of very large and very monumental, very impressive uh, structures, um, which are known as palaces. Uh, this slide is showing you uh, the plan and some photographs of one of these palatial sites. Uh, this is a site called Tiryns, um, which is in um, a region called the Argolid in Greece. Um, so these are really big uh, buildings. They have these big for, uh, fortification walls um, and they have a bunch of different rooms and complexes within them um, that we think you know, were the seat of political power. Uh, there are equally monumental tombs from this period. Um, they're a kind of standard type. So Mycenaean tombs, usually we have um, at the really fancy sites, these big stone built underground tombs called Thalos tombs. They look kind of like a beehive on the inside. Um, and the kind of more um, normal sites have uh, tombs that are similar in, um, in architectural style. So they have a big long kind of entryway and then a big chamber. Uh, but they're just dug into the into the bedrock, so those are called chamber tombs. Uh, burial in this period was was collective, um, so you'd have a bunch of different people buried in these tombs, um, and probably we think you know that's according to clan or family or something like that. Uh, Mycenaean material culture is uh, likewise quite distinctive. Um, so in the Mycenaean period, there's a kind of a ceramic style. You can see a couple of examples in the slide here. Um, so uh, it's this kind of buff fabric with a kind of reddish uh, paint. There are a lot of distinctive shapes, right, that we can immediately say, like, that's Mycenaean pottery. Um, again, the fancier stuff is usually concentrated at um, these big palatial sites, these fancy, um, fancy sites. Uh, they're decorating the walls frequently with um, a, a big kind of uh, fancy, colorful wall paintings um, that show things like deities or uh, people playing music or um, you know, special animals, that kind of thing. Um, and they also have a lot of prestige goods. Uh, so things like gold signet rings or um, these like really, um, really elaborately carved um, seal rings or seal stones. Um, so these are usually uh, made of semi-precious material. Even though we usually refer to the late Bronze Age as um, prehistory, so that's a period before writing, before history exists, uh, there are texts, right, so the Mycenaeans um, in late Bronze Age Greece did have a writing system. And we find uh, writing uh, preserved on clay tablets uh, that are found, again, exclusively at these fancy uh, palatial sites. Um, the, the writing system that the Mycenaeans used, uh, we call it uh, Linear B, that's the name of the script. It was used to write down uh, an early form of the Greek language. Uh, it's, it wasn't an alphabet, it was a syllabary. Um, so uh, it's a, it looks a little bit weird to us. Um, but Mycenaean texts, uh, they're not like used to write down poetry or, or great literature. Um, they're mostly administrative texts. Um, and as such, uh, we can tell a little bit about um, the structure of society, of Mycenaean society, um, based on reading these texts. Um, so we know, again, partly from the Linear B text and partly based on inference from the presence of this dramatic site hierarchy. So we have palatial sites and then we have kind of normal sites. Um, we know this is a relatively hierarchical state um, and it was organized uh, something like what you see on the slide. This is a simplified version of a model of the Mycenaean state. Um, so we know at the top there is a king. The king was called the Wanox. And there were various officials right at different um, uh, regional and local levels who were in charge of doing various jobs for um, the Mycenaean state. Um, and then at the bottom, right, there's, there's someone, a group called the Damos, right, those are, are the kind of regular people. The kings, right, so the, the Wanox and probably the elites of the Mycenaean state um, were very much engaged in uh, in exchange and trade with these other great kingdoms throughout the Mediterranean, throughout the Eastern Mediterranean in this period. Um, so we know there's a lot of uh, prestige goods that are circulating, um, say between Egypt and the Aegean, between Cyprus um, and the Aegean, um, and the Mycenaean state through this period. Uh, within the Mycenaean state, these prestige goods are, are overwhelmingly concentrated at, again, these um, palatial sites. So it seems probably like what the elites are doing 
um, is the king is kind of bringing in these special objects that nobody else has, uh, and then kind of consuming them in a, in a display of, you know, self-aggrandizement, um, or maybe in some cases kind of distributing them out to his retainers, right, as, as a way to curry favor um, amongst other officials. So the Mycenaean state, um, again, is a, a very interesting um, phenomenon, right, in Aegean prehistory, um, and there's much to say about it. Uh, around 1200 BC, uh, things unravel, right? So there's an event um, that we, we call a collapse um, in the Aegean. So these um, palatial sites are uh, largely destroyed or abandoned, um, and generally things in the archeological record um, suggest that something has gone uh, quite wrong with the Mycenaean state. Within the Aegean, what we see in the 12th century that's different um, than what we saw before right, during the Mycenaean palatial period, uh, we call um, the post-palatial period. So the period of time following the collapse of these palaces um, during which the archeological record changes in considerable ways. So we tend to find fewer sites, um, the kind of level of wealth of prosperity that's indicated in those sites is uh, decreased substantially. Um, like I said, a lot of sites that were these big palatial sites are either destroyed or abandoned. Um, and we start to see a lot more um, distinction amongst different regions, right? So different pottery cells in different regions um, that suggests there is, um, you know, a kind of disillusion of whatever the Mycenaean state was. Uh, it's also a period in which we think there were um, a lot of people moving around. So Greece, again, seems to be depopulated. Other places seem to be taking in um, people uh, from Greece. So like people seem to have migrated from Greece to Cyprus. So it's this period in which a lot is changing um, in the aftermath of the kind of absence or the disappearance of these institutions that everybody had been used to. This is not a phenomenon that's unique to Greece. Uh, so the Mycenaean state collapses, but there seem to be a lot of, um, you know, not exactly contemporaneous, but roughly contemporaneous, um, similar collapses in other states in the Eastern Mediterranean at this time. Um, and an obvious question that has been discussed a great deal is what happened and why? Uh, and this is really a great uh, mystery uh, in the field and, you know, it's a complicated situation and we don't really have a clear answer about what exactly happened. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff that you can read about that if you're interested, we can talk about it. Um, I'm more interested in this question of uh, what happens afterwards. Um, so whatever happened with the collapse, it did happen. Um, and so the questions I pursue in my research really are, um, yeah, how, how do people deal, right, in the aftermath? of these collapses, um, life of course goes on. Uh, and so I'm interested in pursuing these questions of, you know, how do communities cope with or um, adjust or um, learn to kind of renegotiate the world uh, when all the kind of institutions they've been used to um, are kind of changing or disappearing all at once. So I, um, I, I think the reason, part of the reason I'm really interested in this kind of aftermath world is that I was really into like post-apocalyptic uh, literature and movies um, when I was growing up, but I still um, find uh, this stuff really fascinating. So I guess if you're of a certain age, you'll probably know about the original Mad Max movies, which is one of my favorite favorites. Um, and I often think about the post-palatial period as a, as a, kind, of, a kind of Mad Max world. Um, and the scene that I'm showing you in the slide is uh, the scene where the, the kind of bad guy, the toe cutter, is, is eating some of this woman's ice cream cone without her permission. And, you know, that's when you know that society, like, is gone, you know, to a weird place. Uh, and that there aren't any, like, police around to protect you. You know, you can't even eat your ice cream cone in peace. So in the post-palatial world of the Aegean, um, as I said, uh, there are all these archaeological indicators of change, um, that things are, uh, are maybe difficult for people in the sense uh, that we don't see as many signs of wealth. Um, there are signs of kind of 
uh, these disruptions in the sense that there are fires and sites are destroyed. Um, and maybe, you know, migration could be seen as a sign that um, society isn't functioning uh, particularly well, uh, or that, you know, conditions have changed such that people are changing their behavior um, in pretty dramatic ways. Uh, most people think that one of the things that happens is that you kind of lose or you kind of shear off this whole top layer of, of the Mycenaean state. So any kind of supra regional authority um, is, is gone. Uh, and what you have left are these kind of local regions and maybe kind of local chieftains uh, left to kind of do uh, different things, right, depending on what seems to make sense um, within the different regions. Now, how, do, how are people choosing, right, who's in charge or how power is negotiated? Um, there's at least some sign that we're kind of uh, entering a world in which um, rather than there's uh, agreed upon political authority, um, there's this kind of might makes right uh, system in which, you know, whoever is the strongest kind of takes control. Um, and that's manifest in some new um, kinds of images that show up in pottery in the post-palatial period. Um, so I'm showing you here a range of kind of uh, 12th century um, ceramic vessels with images on them. Uh, and one, one of the new iconographic themes we begin to see uh, is, uh, yeah, little armed men on boats. Uh, so again, you could, and there's kind of some idea that there's a warrior ideology um, that arises in the 12th century. But the interesting thing too that we see in the 12th century um, is that things don't change entirely. Um, so when you look at that Mycenaean pottery from the 12th century, uh, you can recognize that it's, it's, it's similar in style and shape uh, to what we see in the palatial period. Um, so are these like traditions that are retained at least for a while, um, while other things um, show a pretty complete um, break with the past. So to me, it's a really interesting period because you know, we've had this dramatic, maybe traumatic event of the collapse. Um, and you have this interesting mix of uh, people trying to hang on to like the old culture or the old institutions, um, while also right, things are changing uh, rapidly around them. So that's a little bit of the context, you know, in a very general um, uh, short uh, format of the, the issue of the Bronze Age collapse and, you know, the questions we tend to deal with when we look at the post-palatial period. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how this uh, research area brought me to the place where I'm working now, which is uh, this bay of, uh, a bay called Porto Rafti Bay, um, which is in the region of Attica in Greece. Um, so just to locate us all uh, geographically, um, so we're in um, the modern country of Greece, uh, the region of Attica, which is um, also where Athens is, uh, and the Bay of Porto Rafti, you can see it at the far side of the slide there with the white arrow. Um, it's in the kind of southeastern coast of Attica. Um, if you've ever flown into Athens, you'll probably have flown over it or very near it because the airport um, is really just um, west of the bay. This is what the bay looks like um, from the mountain to its north. Um, it's not a bad place to spend time. Uh, I, if you ever go to Greece, I recommend um, hanging out there. So the reason that Porto Rafti Bay is interesting to me is that it is the location of one of the most important post-palatial sites um, that's known in the Aegean. Um, so this is a cemetery site um, that was excavated on the north side of the bay um, at a site that's known as Parati. So Parati is a large, uh, mostly chamber tomb cemetery um, that was excavated by a Greek archaeologist called Spiridon Yakavides um, back in the 1950s and the 1960s. Now at the time and still today, this is the largest um, post-palatial, so 12th century cemetery um, that's been excavated and published in the Aegean. So it's been a really valuable um, kind of source for understanding things like ceramic chronologies um, and cultural change in the Aegean um, since it was excavated and published. I mean, you can see the, the plan of the site um, behind me on the slide. 
Um, so it's a, rel a relatively large uh, site, over 200 tombs, um, uh, and, and there are probably more, right? So we know that a lot of the tombs in the area were looted before the archeologists could get there. Um, so we're dealing with a really substantial um, archeological site. And there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, going on in these tombs. Um, so one of the things that people think happened in the 12th century, you know, along with the kind of collapse of this uh, series of Eastern Mediterranean states, uh, is that trade networks, right, the trade networks that have been bringing fancy things like ivory um, to and from places like the Aegean, uh, those trade networks, you know, some people think uh, broke down. Uh, and certainly we see much less material indication of, of strong trade connections between the Aegean um, and the Eastern Mediterranean for this period. Um, but Parati is an exception to that rule. Uh, so in fact, um, from the cemetery, uh, there are a lot of imported objects, Eastern, Europe, uh, Eastern Mediterranean imported objects, um, things from Egypt, like scara uh, scarabs, um, things from the kind of Syro-Palestinian coast, so like modern day Israel and Lebanon, um, like these little golden earrings, um, iron knives from Cyprus, and there's a whole, whole um, range of imported objects on the site. So we could say, okay, there's still trade um, and this site is special, um, but they're also kind of weird imports in a way, like a lot of them are really worn, um, but they almost look like they were like personal good luck charms or something rather than the kind of thing that you would um, kind of used to show off um, that you're the king, which is how um, people think that imports were used in the palatial period. Um, architecturally, there's a lot of variety uh, in the tomb types that we see at Parati. Um, so you get some tombs that look a lot like a Mycenaean chamber tomb, um, but there's also um, kind of new types of tomb that occur, like individual burials in like little pit or cyst, uh, as we call cyst tombs. And then there's a, a new way of treating the human body that shows up at Parati, um, pretty much before it shows up at any um, Aegean uh, site, which is um, cremating the, the body. Um, so up to this time in the palatial period, uh, all burials would have been inhumations. That, that is to say you take the body and you put it in the tomb um, without um, uh, burning it on a funeral pyre. Um, at Parati, there are a number of of cremation burials, and that's uh, kind of a new, a new, another new feature of the mortuary record. So I was kind of obsessed with this site of Parati um, for much of my um, career as a scholar so far, and I wrote about it. Uh, I've written about it a lot um, in um, both my book and various articles. Um, and I had a lot of ideas about, you know, what we could say about what's going on with people's lives in the post-palatial period, um, kind of using a careful analysis um, of the evidence from the cemetery. Um, and I had a lot of theories about, you know, how we could explain this combination of, of Mycenaean traditions with um, these kind of novel features, um, why we have these imported objects at this site when they're really rare elsewhere. Um, and, you know, I went through a lot of kind of mental acrobatics trying to come up with uh, reasonable explanations for um, what was going on. And I can talk about those um, in the QA if people want to. Um, but what's ultimately clear when we try to extrapolate about living humans from what we find uh, from their mortuary behavior, from how they bury people, um, is that it's really hard to kind of distinguish between um, all the different possibilities um, just because right, the the decisions people make around burial don't necessarily correl you know, connect in straightforward ways to uh, the way that people live their lives or the way that people thought about, uh, about their lives. Um, so yeah, this is what we call, we call this in archeology span sometimes, um, the equifinality problem, right? That there are all kinds of scenarios we could come up with that would have resulted in the, the mortuary record looking a certain way um, and kind of distinguishing among those is, is difficult. So what I decided was that we really needed to find a settlement to go along with these tombs um, so that we could, you know, find uh, the, the people and where they were living uh, and try to learn more about this community 
um, and try to figure out what their lives uh, were like, who they were um, during the post-colonial period. So I started up this archaeological project um, called the Bays of East Attica Regional Survey. And um, the idea was you know, to go into the Bay of Porto Rafti and to see if we could find um, a likely candidate uh, that would be a settlement that could um, give us some information about the living community um, that was related to this um, burying community um, in Porto Rafti. So that's uh, the Bears project. We had our first season in 2019. Um, and yeah, part of what we're doing is, is trying to figure out um, what's, where, where, the, where a settlement would be in this region. Um, so most of you have read or heard about archaeology probably uh, think about excavation. Um, but there's also a method called surface survey um, in which you know, we're just looking at what's, what, what remains on the surface uh, and trying to talk about um, site distribution and the history of a region um, based on that. So the Bears Project, we're not digging anything up yet. Um, we're just kind of looking at this region uh, as a, you know, a, a, a place where there might be a settlement and trying to find um, what's there. So here you see a satellite image of the Bay of Porto Rafti. Um, and it looks maybe like not a good candidate for a place to do a surface survey because it's like an overdeveloped port town. So a lot of the land that you might want to survey uh, is actually covered in um, concrete and like people's vacation houses now. Um, but despite that, uh, there is a, a lot of archaeology in the Porto Rafti Bay. Um, and most of it that's been kind of seen and documented before our project um, is of course located in these, uh, the undeveloped pieces of land around the bay. So especially these little islands. Uh, so there's this island of Raftis, um, you see the island of Prasso, and then there's another little island of Raftopola, and then we have this peninsula of Punda and the peninsula of Karuni um, too. And you can see also there how these are linked to Parati. So we did a bunch of work in the Bay of Puerto Rafti. Uh, we found a huge early Bronze Age site um, on the Punda Peninsula um, at the west side of the bay. Uh, there's a big Hellenistic um, site and fortification on the Karuni Peninsula. Um, so we weren't exclusively um, focused on uh, identifying this post-palatial settlement, um, but that's really the reason I was there. So for me, the, the kind of, um, yeah, the silver tuna, I guess as Kevin McAllister would say, for those who are familiar with Home Alone. Um, for me, is this Islet of Raftis. Uh, so the Islet of Raftis is this uh, pyramidal islet at the mouth of the bay. Uh, it's called Raftis because there is a Roman imperial period statue um, that's been installed at the top of the pyramid of the island. Uh, it's in really bad shape. It wasn't put there by the Romans. Um, that's a whole other mystery. Um, but the local lore is that um, this guy represents uh, um, like a tailor, like a, and that, like a guy who sews things. And the Greek word for um, tailor is Raftis. All right, so the island is named after this statue that sits at the peak. Now, there have long been rumors of archaeological finds of post-palatial pottery on this island of Raftis. Uh, but no one's really taken them seriously before because um, people think of Parati as this really prosperous site uh, where people are doing really well. And the idea is like nobody who's rich would live on this little island. Um, so people have kind of ignored it. But I was really convinced um, for a long time that, that the settlement for Parati, the settlement associated with the site had to be on Raftis because um, it was the only site in the region that had any rep reports of um, post-palatial pottery, uh, and it's got this visual relationship with Parati. I mean, that's normal for Mycenaean cemeteries, right? That you have, you can look across and see the burials. Um, and so the sighting, you know, the kind of geographical relationship uh, to me was really interesting. So we spent a lot of time in 2019 uh, surveying on Raftis. Um, and these are some shots of, uh, of the team in 2019. Uh, and indeed we found um, a huge site there. Uh, there not only is pottery on the on the island, but 
Um, there's, you know, the whole surface is really carpeted um, in Mycenaean pottery. Um, I've never seen a site that was so kind of densely uh, strewn with Mycenaean pottery um, in my whole life of, of being an archaeologist. So we only collected a small sample of what was there because um, we had a small team and we would have overwhelmed ourselves if we had collected all the pottery there. Um, but certainly, you know, we're very convinced at this point that whoever was burying their dead at Perati, um, they were living on this little um, island of the Aptes. So what did we, what did we find? Um, and uh, what does it seem to tell us about how, um, yeah, how life was in the 12th century in this bay uh, and who these people were. Um, so that's what I'll uh, kind of finish the talk with now. So as I said, you know, one interesting aspect of the archeology span of Puerto Rafi Bay is that, you know, people have kind of known forever that there was some post-palatial pottery on Rafti's and that people might have been living there. Um, but largely, again, this possibility has been seen as very remote because the island is not an obvious place to live. Uh, so it obviously has access to almost no agricultural land. Uh, the topography is incredibly steep, so it's a very steep slope. Um, there's not an obvious place to dock a boat, at least not today. Um, and you don't really have access to water. So the idea that the people, this large community of people um, who seem to be very prosperous, who are very noted in Parati, the idea that they would live on this island has seemed really far-fetched to people. Uh, so the kind of existing idea, um, and the one that I kind of refer to in the title to my talk, uh, is that um, Raftis, is an island of refuge. So it was a place where people who were kind of uh, hanging on for dear life uh, went to hide. Um, and that it's, it's part of a pattern. So in the late, the post-palatial period in the Bronze Age, again, and then again in the late Roman period, so much later, um, people start kind of exploiting these little micro islets uh, that are near the coast, but not, not connected to the coast um, around the Southern Aegean. So Raftis is one example of this, but, uh, but there are more. Um, and so the idea is that um, places like this is another one of these sites, an island of Modi, uh, which is just off the um, island of Poros, again in the surrounding Gulf, if you're familiar with Greece. Um, and kind of all these islands look like a cartoon of like a terrible place to live, right? So the, the island of Modi is an extreme example. It's this little rocky kind of cliff that sticks out of the sea. But there's a post-palatial site there and people are obviously doing something on these sites. And so the usual interpretation is um, that these are, again, just kind of refuge communities. Now what we found on Raftis, uh, just from the beginning, didn't seem to fit with this model very well. Um, so first of all, we found a huge amount of material, right? So just the quantity of the pottery um, was a little suspicious that we're trying to reconstruct this community as like, you know, people fleeing some horrible threat and hiding out. Uh, the pottery also is extremely high quality. Um, so the ceramic chronological term for post-palatial pottery is LH3C. Um, and all the pottery found on the island um, from the Mycenaean period um, dates to this LH3C, this post-palatial period. I mean, it's really, really fancy stuff. So if you're not used to survey archaeology, you will look at this slide and think like, this does not look fancy. It's just a bunch of dumb pot shirts. Um, but this is really nice painted uh, Mycenaean pottery and the kind of stuff that we hardly ever find in surveys. And every unit that we had on Raftis had, had tons and tons of, uh, of these fine uh, Mycenaean painted shirts. Um, and, and pretty much every shape that you could ask for. Um, so kind of ceremonial drinking vessels, uh, vessels for pouring. Um, storage vessels for large amounts of olive oil, uh, for wine. And we really had the whole repertoire of Mycenaean shapes. Uh, another really interesting uh, characteristic of the uh, ceramic assemblage on Raptis is that uh, there are a huge range of different kinds of cooking pots, um, which is extremely, extremely unknown for the post-palatial period. So these fancy, weird kind of food ways, so ways of cooking, 
um, are only evident in palatial sites in the palatial period, uh, and no one's ever found them at any other site in the post-palatial period. Um, so these people have all this fancy cookware. Um, there's evidence for ritual. Um, so this is the uh, the head of a little zoomorphic uh, animal headed riton. Um, so a riton where you would kind of pour ritual wine out of. Um, we have a ton of figurines from the site too. Uh, we have evidence for industry. Um, so there's slag and pieces of bronze and iron. Um, there's a, a huge number of um, grinding stones, so uh, volcanic grinding stones. Uh, we found um, the kind of round black thing on the slide is a, uh, a balance weight, so made of hematite, and it would have been used right at, uh, on a scale to kind of weigh out things for exchange. Uh, we think people are making pottery on or around the islet. So there's a local kind of pottery called whiteware, and we have a ton of whiteware from Parati. We have a ton of whiteware from around the whole Aegean in this period. Um, and on the Raftis Island, we found uh, whiteware that had been like over fired so that it had almost turned into glass and turned this weird green color. Um, and when you find stuff like that, it usually suggests that um, there's production of the pottery taking place nearby. Uh, and then finally, um, we have evidence of trade, uh, which is not totally surprising given what's present in, what's present in the cemetery. Um, but there's uh, a, a fragment, which does not look that cool, which is the kind of gray like lump um, on the far, uh, to my far right. Um, and that is assured from a special kind of jar called a Canaanite jar, uh, which is um, usually only found um, it's a special kind of jar that's made um, at the Syro Palestinian coast, right? So, in, uh, probably around Haifa in modern Israel. And usually we only would find these at palaces in the Palatial period. Um, so, it's a very special kind of jar um, that kind of normal people aren't supposed to have access to. Um, so, it's very surprising that um, we would have this not at a palace uh, as we would expect to find it, right? Where these kings kind of lord over these special imports. Um, but instead, um, and we find them sometimes on these big shipwreck cargoes that also seem connected to palatial trade. Um, so for us, it was very kind of shocking to find this super special, super unusual um, shirt of a Canaanite jar on this little island. Uh, another cool find uh, that shows probably trade or exchange of some kind is a little clay nodule um, that's inscribed with some kind of sign, right? Some kind of sign, like a letter. Uh, that um, is again very shocking to find in a period of which like writing has disappeared um, but they're using probably the this nodule to annotate something maybe um, to mark something in an exchange context. Uh, there's a lot of architecture on the site too um, so probably there are a lot of buildings and walls um, obviously there's a lot of collapse um, and things have eroded um, but um, it's not just pottery and finds all over the surface, uh, but we have evidence that this is a very built up um, islet too. So if we wanted to say that, okay, we have these people living on this islet in the 12th century, um, it's a refuge islet. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense with the evidence, right? We would think if it's a refuge, you know, the people are scared and they're not thriving, um, but we have, all this really nice fancy stuff that shows industry, that shows trade, um, that doesn't really align with a kind of model that's, that paints these people as kind of cowering in fear on Rafti's Island. But then the question is how, how can we explain right, the choice in this period to move to this little island um, and this choice to move to these little mini islands um, in general. And that's of course something that's hard to to answer and we've been batting around a lot of ideas and like if, if other people have ideas you know that would be great to discuss. Um, something that I was thinking about a lot this summer uh, was the idea that um, the people on Raftis are not hiding from somebody but they're kind of the people that other people are hiding from. Right so I did some sailing around uh, Port of Rafti in the area this summer and I noticed that when you're in the bay, when you're out sailing, um, 
you can't really, like the islands, the Raftis Island and the Karuni Peninsula, they all just kind of disappear into the background of the mountains behind. I mean, you would never know that anybody was there, right on this island, on the, on the west side of it, the inland side, um, if you're sailing past. We also know from anecdotes um, that local people who sail around tell us that um, when there's a storm, ships, because of the currents, almost all will blow into the Puerto Rafi Bay. So you can kind of imagine um, something like a, a little pirate community um, living on this side of the bay, uh, on the island in the bay, um, kind of laying in wait for these ships to blow in and then being in a perfect position to kind of sally forth um, and take all their fancy stuff. Right? And that kind of gives us an explanation for why they didn't care about access to agricultural land um, and why they were happy to kind of live in this place. Right? And it's kind of more of a positive explanation. So instead of them hiding there because they're afraid, they're hiding there because it's advantageous to them uh, in terms of their kind of economic strategy. And this, of course, you know, okay, ancient pirates seems a little far-fetched maybe, um, but so far to me, it's the kind of most like logical way to come to terms with the weird location of the site and the amazing uh, wealth that the finds show. Um, and I also thought, you know, it's close to Halloween, so why not finish the presentation with an appeal to the, to the pirate? Um, and maybe, you know, in the ancient world, people believed a lot in like bird signs. Uh, and I will note that recently in Athens, um, feral wild monk par feral parakeets have been taking over the kind of pigeon habitat. So maybe the, the, the parrots are giving us the sign that what we're dealing with in Puerto Rafi um, could be some kind of, yeah, exploitative or um, kind of pirate community. Now, obviously again, with the survey finds, the finds from the surface, um, we face the same kind of interpretative problems that we have uh, with um, the, um, the, the mortuary finds, right? We can think of all these possibilities to explain the finds, um, but you know, they could have gotten there in a number of different ways. So probably what we, what we need to do um, eventually will be to excavate the site. Um, like I said, there's a lot of architecture and it's clear that there are a lot of um, good archeological deposits on the island. Um, so uh, hopefully, you know, one day uh, we'll finish the survey, um, but I don't think we could solve this enigma of, of rafties um, without maybe um, getting in there and, uh, and, and excavating some good context, right, where we could actually see, is there production happening? You know, what kind of political hierarchy might we see? Um, how do we, you know, make sense of these people? So hopefully we will get to do that someday. I mean, at this point, it's not clear that we'll be able to work in Greece anytime soon uh, with our team. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the plan going forward. Uh, I just want to close by thanking um, our, our um, institutional sponsors. So we uh, have a permit from the Canadian Institute in Greece uh, and the East Africa Effort of Antiquities. Um, we have funding from a number of um, generous uh, organizations in Canada and elsewhere. Um, I also want to thank uh, our amazing team from 2019. Uh, we had an extremely wonderful group of people um, that helped us uh, do the survey that's produced uh, almost all the finds um, that I told you about today. Um, yeah, and it was too bad. We were all, all very excited to get back and continue the work, but uh, 2020 had other plans for us. Um, we did manage to have three people <laughs> go to Greece and work this summer. So, because um, I was in Canada, we were um, allowed to go to the EU. Um, and then a couple of our ceramicists were either in Greece already or in the EU too. Um, so we had a very tiny 2020 study season. But Bartek, who's the Polish um, ceramicist there uh, in the middle, he's, he's the one that identified our Canaanite jar shirt. Um, so we did accomplish something at least. Um, today or this year, even though we couldn't um, get a lot done. So thanks all, all of you for your attention um, and, uh, and for uh, joining us this evening. Um, and of course, uh, happy to take any questions. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. We have uh, three questions that came in. Um, Rebecca asks, after the palatial system collapsed, was wealth more evenly distribu distributed? 
Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, it's kind of a hard question to answer in this, I mean, in any archaeological context to, to make clear from the remains that we have uh, how equal wealth was distributed, uh, right? Because we don't have any figures for income or GDP. Uh, and also, we only have the sites that we excavate. Um, so it's always possible that, you know, we're missing a huge number of sites that would give us a different picture um, than what we have. But I think it's kind of, yeah, it's almost certainly true that in an absolute sense, you're kind of knocking off the top of the, you know, the ultra rich from the, the economic hierarchy. Um, and it does look like things like fancy imported objects, uh, things like metal objects, which would have been kind of hard to acquire. Um, if we just look at how well those are distributed amongst the different sites we have, and they do come, become massively more well distributed, if that makes sense, after the collapse. Um, so, so one would imagine that you have these elites in the palatial period and they're kind of, they're kind of like, have this stranglehold on fancy things. Um, and they kind of are controlling um, resources to the extent they can. And once that stranglehold is like released, um, it becomes more like people have more agency on their own to, to acquire things, to go out and build trade relations by themselves. Um, so yeah, it does seem like, you know, the, the, the result of this kind of disaster for some people may have been, may have been okay, right? You kind of lose the, the tax burden, right? The elites are probably doing a lot of like marching around and threatening your stomping on your stuff and taking your crops. So yeah, I, I would say there's probably more equality afterwards. Okay, thank you. We have two more questions. Just a reminder that if you have questions, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A and we'll be getting to them. Uh, Carol asks, what's the possibility that the collapse was due to a pandemic type situation? And that the burial customs changed because cremation was the best way to handle the dead. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, and certainly it's interesting the, to think about the way that what happens in the world around us um, impacts the way that we imagine things going in the past. Um, any, any kind of suggestion of like a pandemic or, or a disease as a cause for the collapse um, has never really found favor you know, in the literature before. And when people have suggested it, people have usually just like, dismissed it out of hand. Um, but now, now it seems much more plausible to us, right? Because we, we see what a pandemic can do. Uh, so far, it's, you know, there isn't any compelling evidence for that. Uh, but it's not something maybe that would be super visible archaeologically. Um, in terms of the human remains. So there are some things that you can look at human remains and identify the cause of death with. Um, so like, you know, bludgeoning or like certain kinds of um, cancer, or like uh, malnutrition, where they leave a, a mark on the bones. Uh, but something like a flu wouldn't. Uh, so we, you know, there might be ways to investigate this question of like, how would we, how would we prove um, that there was a pandemic um, that could have brought about the collapse of these states? Um, but I think, yeah, so, and people are starting to think about that, um, but up to now, it hasn't really been a popular avenue of inquiry. But that's something that we thought about, I talked about this with some friends early this year, um, because it seems like, okay, one reason you would move to a tiny island is that you're, you're away from, like, you know, the mainland where maybe this disease is circulating. So that's certainly something that we've talked about is um, that uh, an explanation for this like movement to the tiny islands could it could be related to some kind of plague or disease for sure. Thank you. Uh, Judy asks, aside from Mad Max, what else inspired you to venture to the other side of the world for your archaeological work? Uh, yeah, that's, I don't, I didn't know anything about Greece really or Greek archaeology when um, I was younger. Uh, and it was really just kind of random chance, in a sense, uh, that led me to this career. Uh, when I went to college, I really wanted to be a geologist, because um, when I was growing up, um, my dad 
Um, and I would go with the Marietta College uh, Earth Sciences um, people on these field trips to like look for geodes. Uh, and I really liked hiking and being outside. And it seemed like geology would be an interesting way to combine that with a career. Um, but then I went to college and uh, basically my, it was, it's anyway, it's kind of a long story, but I was dissuaded from doing earth sciences. Um, and then I kind of randomly ended up taking a class in Roman archeology, span I think because I had read I Claudius and I really liked I Claudius. Uh, and then I thought it was really cool. The professors were really nice to me. Um, but, but then I went to Greece on a study abroad program and I totally just became like obsessed with spending as much time in Greece as I possibly could for the rest of my life. Uh, so it was really, that was really the thing that kind of uh, cemented it was, uh, I really just love uh, the country and I like the landscape and um, the food and the people. And I just think it's a wonderful place to spend time. So that's certainly a factor too. Great. Uh, we have another question come in. Uh, Jan asked, there has, been a, there has been a long theory that the collapse of the Mycenae, I'm sorry, I'm trying to say this correctly for you all, Mycenaean civilization was due to the invasion of the Sea Peoples. Could this be a collective memory of the pirates from this and other small hidden areas? Could the pirates then change uh, to slave traders in the later period? Homer mentioned slaves. Could they have also traded slaves. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's, those are a series of really interesting and really smart ideas. Um, the Sea Peoples, you know, it's this yet long-standing theory that all these destructions were driven by kind of a band, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, a band of um, kind of seaborne, um, not necessarily just pirates, but, but entire communities. Um, that were kind of moving into the Eastern Aegean and progressively um, kind of landing in these different regions and, and causing all these collapses, um, you know, through violent means. I mean, the, the origin of that story is basically uh, the, a text that we have from ancient Egypt. Uh, so from a, the funerary temple of the um, pharaoh that was in charge when these people showed up. Um, and the Egyptians were one of the few people that like, that um, dispatched the sea peoples, right, that defeated them. And so the, uh, the pharaoh is like bragging about um, the sea peoples and how he defeated them and how they're really awful and, and mean. And so that's, the existence of that text has given rise to this whole idea about the sea peoples. And most people now think, you know, that story is way too simple. There are all kinds of things that it can't account for. Um, and that the sea peoples phenomenon, whatever it was, was more of a symptom than the cause of the, of the problems. So that uh, most people now reconstruct some kind of like climate change or change in the kind of regime of rainfall um, throughout the Mediterranean at this time. So the idea is you might have had these people kind of like the people that fled um, uh, the central United States in the Dust Bowl, right? So if their area where they were living became uninhabitable, they, would, they were trying to find a new place to live. Um, and that there wasn't just one group, that there were all these different people that were moving around for various reasons. Um, so yeah, again, they, they, they are something like pirates. So it could be, I, my feeling is that there are a lot of kind of people moving around and, and maybe without, you know, without a state to enforce any kind of laws or any kind of, you know, behavior, a lot of that, a lot of people would just be, yeah, taking whatever they could by force. Um, and some of those people would be the sea peoples. And I think it's an era in which like you can imagine Piracy generally would be pretty common. As far as slave trading, like absolutely, there was probably the Mycenaeans probably had slaves that they took um, through uh, military conquest, um, and, and certainly in, Homer, in the Homeric texts, which are from just after the post-palatial period, uh, refer to slave trading too. Um, so I, I would imagine it was happening in the in the 12th century too. Um, and again, it's one of these things that's really hard to prove archaeologically, like without texts. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, almost certainly that was happening to some degree. And it's kind of funny because with the Greeks, like we think that the Greeks are really great. So we never like to talk about how they were basically always, uh, a slave society. Um, I don't see why it would have been any different, um, for uh, the 12th century too. 
Thank you. Uh, one last question that we'll take is from John, and he asked, uh, the Canaanite shirt, uh, it is, it is uh, really possible to identify that from what we saw on the screen. Um, so what was it that, what is it that identifies it uh, is the question. Yeah, and that is a great question. And um, it is amazing for me. I'm not a, I'm not a ceramics person. Uh, and I rarely work in the lab. I am like a creature of the mountain and I love being in the field and like traipsing around and finding stuff. And you know, I never get tired. That's one of my superpowers. But when you put me into the lab, like I really am not, um, I'm not used to that kind of stuff and I don't have the knowledge um, that a ceramicist has in, in terms of identifying um, that kind of pottery. But this summer I was in the lab um, with, um, with, uh, with Bartek, our, our ceramicist, and he's amazing. It's really this kind of special magic that ceramicists have that they can look at something that to us looks like just some weird lump of nothing, and they can extract all this information about it. Um, so according to Bartek, um, the fabric, right, so the kind of uh, ceramic material that this kind of pot is made out of, this jar, is like, incredibly distinctive, um, and partly because the people that made the Canaanite jars use sand as the temper in the, the, the fabric, right, the matrix of clay that they um, later used to make the jar. And so, and it's special sand, it's, it's sand from Egypt, from the Nile that blows up, or kind of um, comes up from the coast, along the coast of Israel. Um, so it has a particular grain to it. Um, and the fact that it's there is very distinctive because most um, people in the Bronze Age didn't use sand as a temper. Um, and according to Bartek, too, you can use the grain of the sand to distinguish between um, Canaanite jars made in like northern Israel and, and jars in southern Israel. Right, so there's a lot of, um, a lot that these ceramicists can see that we can't see um, that, you know, allows them to make these, these distinctions. Um, but the Canaanite jar, too, it's, it's got this gray color on the inside and it's red on the outside. Um, and it has a kind of, you can see a little bit of the, the curve of the shape. Um, so all those things um, make it, yeah, almost a, a sure thing that it is, uh, it is what Bartek says it is. That's a good question. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. I did want to see if Wes had any uh, additional uh, questions or anything that he wanted to add before we uh, thanked everyone. So Wes, if you wanted to turn your microphone in and screen yeah. on for me. Yeah. It's, a, it's on, no, um, I, I actually um, had a question about the sea people and whether they related to her uh, pirates um, on the island there. And, and someone else came up with pretty much the very same question I had. So thanks very much, Sarah. All right, great. Thank you so much. We hope everyone enjoyed uh, the presentation. And again, thank you, Sarah, for providing it for us. I know we kind of had a long running conversation throughout the year to get this scheduled and we're happy to do it virtually. Um, we have a lot of people joining us from a very wide area across the, across the country. Um, so we're happy to provide access for that. Uh, if you enjoyed Sarah's presentation, we would uh, like to ask if you make a online donation. I've provided the links in the chat for that information, uh, as well as consider becoming a member. Uh, just a reminder that the recording for this presentation will be up within the next few days on uh, on our um, website and you can go and make a donation to uh, hear it then tell your friends as well that you that they missed a great presentation and they can come listen to it on the castle's website so uh, thank you sarah again and thank you all for joining us <laughs>